uh, an apostle. No, it's not a chief tension title. Then you should also understand it is not something we receive by inheritance. Uh, you say, okay, my father was a pastor, and since he was a pastor, I also am going to be a pastor. No, it's a calling. It's a, it's a calling. And once you have it, you should understand that a calling is a calling. Uh, a calling is an assignment. Like I always say, that ministry is, a, is an assignment. It is God calling us to relate with him. Then by our relationship with him, we can affect others for him. Now, by our relationship. Ministry is not like um, you are, uh, how do I say it? Ministry is not like uh, um, um, somebody is just waking up. I've had this. Let me go and say this. No. Ministry is like you are breastfeeding a child. You have eaten. And from what you have eaten, the child begins to suck the breast and uh, is, he extracts what you have eaten from you. Now, that's why if you are a minister, you are expected to affect lives positively for God. To affect lives positively for God. You know, so many wrong things are happening now uh, in the body of Christ that people are losing focus. Now we see that one of the areas of uh, f uh, focus the devil has given to so many of ministers today is that people are now focusing on cathedrals, building of cathedrals, rather than building of people. Now, is building of cathedrals wrong? No. Now, you will see a pastor that is here to have even a member to follow him. You know, not even one member. You begin to run around. Ah, I have to build. I have to build. I'm going to build the, the most beautiful church in town. That, that was not how Jesus started ministry. You know, when you look at the Bible very well, you will see that when Jesus was to start ministry, the first documentation written about him in the Bible was he searched for knowledge. At the age of 12, he followed his parents to the temple as usual every year. And the Bible says when they were returning, two days after they have been, they, they, they've gone for the, they were coming back, they checked and they didn't see him in the mix, in their mix. Ah, uh -uh, what's happening? No, they went a day's journey, sorry. So they had to come back another one day journey, making two days. And they saw him after three days, that's making five. Which means for five good days, he was not with his parents at age 12. And the Bible says when they found him, where did they find him? They find him am among doctors, listening to them and doing what? And asking them questions. You know, and one of the reasons why he was doing that is this. Because if you are going to become a vessel in God's hands, you know, our ministry is not just about, uh, uh, please, come and attend to this. I'm sorry. It's one of the pastors that wants to be in the meeting. We use this for monitor. As we're watching online, I know the number of people. Hallelujah. So, you know, so that the, the importance of knowledge is you can have enough revelation to bring the people out of bondage. You know, today we have ministers that will just go to the pulpit without any form of preparation. And they say, oh, okay, they'll just lead them prayer on prayers. Just pray. Just pray. No. The people need to be impacted with knowledge. The people what? need to be impacted with knowledge. Now, it is knowledge that makes them strong. What, not, what did you learn from the service? You have nothing to say. But that was not how Jesus started. He sat with doctors, listening to them, and asking questions. Now, if every minister of God is rich enough in knowledge, hear me, will have transformed the world will have transformed even our nation, Nigeria. But the thing is that the focus is not where, how Jesus started it. What people are looking for now is the miraculous. But Jesus didn't start with the miraculous. Even after he left, you know, they took him back home. We didn't hear anything about his ministry again until after 18 years, when he was 30. Now, by the time he was 30, that he came out again. The first documentation According to others, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke. Now, 
John's own is a little bit different. But his first doc, the next doc, documentation we saw is that he went after John the Baptist. Now, what did he go to do from John? He still went to, went to land. When John saw him coming, they knew themselves in the spirit. John wanted to kneel down for him to baptize him. He said, no, let's do it according to how he's supposed to be. So he submitted himself under mentorship again. You know, don't forget, age 12, he was learning from doctors. Age 30, he came for impartation. And if you look at, follow him, after he was impacted, he came out of the baptism. What was the next thing he went to do? He now started gathering people. He didn't start church by gathering people. He now started gathering people when he had what to share with them. So as ministers, please, let us just see this as very important. We need to grow when it comes to the issue of knowledge. So that we will not just be destroying the lives of people that God will be gathering around us. I pray that the work of God in our hands will flourish and prosper greatly in Jesus' name. So we are looking at this morning uh, five major tests you must pass through to enter greatness in ministry. Five major tests you must pass through to enter greatness in ministry. Five major tests. There are five major tests that one must go through to enter greatness. Now, when I say greatness, I'm not talking about uh, physical, uh, financial, whatsoever. I'm talking about you fulfilling the mandate of God for your life. You fulfilling the mandate of God for your life. Hallelujah. I also welcome Pastor Eniola Matthew online. He's watching online. And we are going to take this five tests from the life of one of the men that God called a man after his heart, David. We will study David and we'll see how we can relate his, his life and experience with ministry today. Five major tests you must pass through to enter greatness. You know, when Paul was rounding up, he said, I have finished my course. So life itself is a test. I've completed my race. So life itself is a test. So let's take them one after the other. Looking at the life of David, I learned this very big lesson. Now, at the first time when God was using these things to raise me, I didn't know it was anything that could, I could document. It was the experience I had with God. Now, but today I now understand why it was so. Now, let's look at it one after the other. The first one is the test of pride after David was anointed by the greatest prophet of their time. I will explain. The test of pride. The test of pride. The test of pride. The test of pride. Now, let's not forget. In Matthew chapter 1, uh, first Samuel, sorry, chapter 17, from verse 14 to 20. Sa Prophet Samuel was sent by God to the house of Jesse. Remember that issue? And uh, he came, your sons, consecrated them. David was not invited. Now, when David now finally came, uh, you know, because Samuel had to ask that out of all your sons that are here, God is looking for somebody. But the somebody is not among them. Do you have any other son? They said, it's only this one. No, this boy is always at the way. He's with the sheep. That's what he does. That's what we, the assignment was committed to his hand. He's with the sheep, taking care of the sheep. He said, okay, Samuel said, go send for him. We won't sit down until he arrives. Now, when Samuel, uh, when David came back, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came. This is the man I've chosen to be king. Now, after God uh, spoke that word to Samuel, Samuel picked the oil and anointed David king in the presence of his father and his relative. Now, that the, what happened that day, for you to know that it was not just his brothers alone that were, was there, Saul later had information of it. 
But do you notice that even after David was anointed, now we can call that anointing of kingship, we can uh, use it as a typology of our calling today. For instance, the day you were ordained as a pastor or the day God spoke to you and said, I'm calling you, you know, every one of us that come to, came into ministry had the encounter, I'm calling you as my servant, this is what I want to use you to do, and things and things like that. Do you know that after that day, everybody will expect, you don't, because people will be saying, that's the next king. When he's passing, that's the next king. When he's passing, that's the next king. Oh, that's the next king of Israel. After Saul, he's going to be the next one. David did not allow it to enter into his head. The Bible made us to understand. I will still show you. He returned to where? He returned to the wilderness to care for the sheep. He returned to the wilderness. Why did God ordain him first? Before the day he was brought into office of kingship. Because after ordination, he was also coming. Why did God ordain him first? Ever before that day, God wanted to prove David's heart. To prove him with what? He wants to test David's ability to conquer pride. Now, one of the reasons why so many ministers cannot attain to what God wants, to, the level God wants to take them to, and why they cannot reach what, what God wants to do in, in their life. Listen, so many people have hindered the move of God in their own life with pride. Don't you know that God? Whatever God have told you, it is between you and God. What? I come again. Whatever God have told you. The Bible made us on. He went back. Now, we are quoted for you. Let's go there and read. 1 Samuel 17 from verse 14. Please put it on screen. You will see that the Bible says, his father now sent for him. David, sir, come and take a, a provision to your brothers uh, at the battlefront. Yes, sir. And I want you to bring for me a pledge to be sure that your brothers are alive. Yes, sir. If it were to be so many people, their father would not be able to send them around again because he has the anointing of kingship already upon his head. So the first test, now let's look at it. Now Jesus said to his son, David, take this ephah of roasted grain and thin loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Run to their camp. Thick along these ten cheeses to the commander of their, of their unit. See how your brothers are, are and bring back some assurance from them. Move on, move on, move on. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Verse 20. Verse 20. So early in the morning, look at this. David did what? Left the flock with a shepherd. Wait. That was the man that was ordained the next king in chapter 16. That's the next king. You know, there are some things, uh, those of us that you know, understand calling, there are some things God shows us that he will do through our hands when he's calling us. Some of us, in Revelations, we can see cripples rising to work at the sound of our prayers. Some of us, we hear words of prophecy, my son, I'm going to, you are going to become so great. You hear so many great things. Do not allow the great things your ears have heard to make you proud. Now, and if you look at the scripture we read, now look at it very well. It was not the day that Paul, uh, sorry, that David, you know, I was preaching to, using Paul yesterday, that David had that call and received that oil that he entered that service. Hello? You will see that there was time. After the anointing, the pronouncement of Samuel upon him that you are the next king of Israel, he went back to the sheep. Sincerely, I was in a minister's meeting many years ago and they asked Pastor Matthew Ashimolo a question. Hey, Pastor, what do you see about this uh, full-time thing and things like that? You know what Pastor Matthew said? He said, if I had known what I know now, I would not have come into full-time ministry when I came in. David went back to the sheep. Let's maintain our 
message. So you will not be confused. Pride. After God must have called you, he has spoken to you. He will be observing you. There are so many servants of God who will tell you, do you know that because God has called me, I cannot persuade to greet my biological father anymore. Some will say, because God has called I was here, one man of God was cursing his wife. He said, don't, don't you know you are talking to an anointed man of God? Telling his wife, you are talking to me like this? I curse you with my cup. Ah, ah. And I said, Pastor, now, you will know that that calling and the promise of God, the oil of grace that was poured upon his life has triggered pride in him. Yes, we are not ordinary people, but let us make ourselves and see ourselves with ordinary eyes so that we can remain humble in his hands. Because those that God will lift are humble people. Now, I've been married, this is 20 years. I've been pastoring 23 years. I've been called into ministry 30 years. But sir, it has not changed anything about my habit with my wife and children. In fact, it didn't change anything when my parents were still alive. I still wash their clothes for them, even as a pastor. I still run, I still run errands for them. If you don't conquer pride at the beginning, it will affect you when you get to the top. That's if you get to the top. So, look at what David did. After he was anointed, he went back to the sheep. And it was easy for his father to still send him on errand. Let's even confirm. Did he go? We are in verse 20. Verse 20. Where are you? So, early in the morning, look at that. David left the flock. Left the flock with the shepherd. Loaded up and set out. As J.C. had what? A directed. He reached the camp. Yeah, you were just in 20. Stop at 20. He reached the camp as the, as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the, the war cry. He reached the camp. He ran the, mess, the errand. The calling does not mean that you should allow any form of pride. Hallelujah. I wrote here, please understand that there is a divine timing for everything. Now, understand it clearly. Now, there's a time God will call you. There's a time he will want you to ex start executing the call. It may not be immediately. Only imagine, let's say, let's say. Now, most times, one of the reasons why a lot of people suffer a lot is because they miss the timing. The timing. It affected me too. I was in secondary school many years ago. 1990, that was 1992. When I first had my first encounter, do you know that I was to write why I didn't want to write it? My pastor had to force me, just go and write it for writing's sake. I finished writing why I didn't go back to collect my resort today. I just ran straight into ministry, not even know what to do, where to go, because I knew God has called me. I was just rushing. Is, that was exactly what happened here. Now look at Jesus at the age of 12. The Bible says he went to the temple. The Bible, if you go to read that 41, 42, 43, the Bible says even the teachers and the doctors of the law were astonished at his, the questions he was as, asking and the way he was responding to what they were teaching. That's a good ground to start ministry now, but he had to stay with for another 18 years. If, if it were to be today, they will start ministry that day. Now, look at the one, two. He went, according to the writing of John, that he went to the wedding at Cana of Galilee. The mother said, okay, Mundi, I have run out of wine. Jesus himself said to his mom, mommy, don't push me out before my time. There is timing. One of the reasons why a lot of people go through a lot of struggling is because they didn't get the timing right. So, what do you do when you are going through the, the, the test of pride? What do you do when you are going through the test of pride? Now, at that particular time, eh, I thought God has called mommy, I love looking. <laughs> now, at that at a particular time, God expects you to use it for self-development. 
what I could go expect you to use it to develop yourself. Do you know that it was those days that David discovered the uh, I mean, sorry, developed the music skill that he had? You know, it was his musical skill that took him to the palace. But he developed it where? In the wilderness. It was those days that David discovered his warfare skill. He killed the lion, he killed the bear. Where? Is it in town? In the wilderness. And don't forget, it was that warfare skill that made him prominent in Israel when he faced Goliath. What do you do in your waiting period? You use your waiting period, hear me, to continue to develop yourself. Your waiting period is a time in your ministry when manifestation of glory is still scarce. It's not that God cannot bring it, bam, he can but if he brings it the way he has shown you, that manifestation may sweep you out of ministry. Ah, sir, this, uh, these 30 years, I have seen so many ministers. I've seen so many ministers. I, I remember those days, many years ago. I don't know if some of you were, were still conversant with those names. Those days. We used to have one man of God, Reverend Dr. Ibeneme, Faith Clinic International. In the 90s, Reverend Ibeneme was a part, a deliverance, if you mention deliverance anywhere in Africa, they will say go to Faith Clinic at Polytechnic Road, Ijokodo. People flew their, their family members from far and near. You know why he died? He died of liver failure. He fasted so much. Even on his dying bed, his liver packed up. On his dying bed, people were still kneeling before him. And he was still casting out demons in them. Could God not heal him? God could heal him. Why did he have to die that way? He died that way because, hear me, during your waiting se uh, season, there are some skills you, you must develop that will help you when the crowd begins to come. Imagine if David had not had time to develop his musical skill. When they needed an instrumentalist in the palace. Because the way God planned it, he still had to go close to the palace to learn how they do in the palace. Ever before he will now come to become king. So that's why he got a job to play instrument to the main man, the king himself. So during the test of pride period, what do you do? You self-develop. You develop how to write books. You develop how to write messages. You develop how to pastor people. You read books. Because a time is going to come in ministry, you want to read the books, but you don't have enough time. Praise the Lord. Number two. Number two. The second one is the test of creativity. The test of creativity. That's the next test. Now, you know this particular test of creativity at this particular time, eh? Look up if you are finished writing. God will give you people, but not the kind of people you need or you have seen in your vision. You know, you, when you got a call into ministry, that's, that's, that's what you saw in visions. But the kind of people you will see coming when you are facing the test of creativity will be the, they are, it's like they will be the opposite of the kind of people you saw in your vision. You know why God will make you pass through that test? He wants to see how creative you can be with the resources available to you at a moment. That's why if you go to the ministry of David, you will see 1 Samuel chapter 22, 1 to 4. Who were the first set of men that came to him? 400 men. The Bible says, number one, they were what? Men who were distressed. Number two, men who were in debt. Number three, men who were discontent. God doesn't begin with us in ministry with giving us more than enough. He gives us what is not enough. 
so that he can now see how creative we can be with what is not enough. Now show me that scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 22 from verse 1 to verse 4. David left God and escaped. Okay. All those who were... No, no, let's take it from verse 1. David left God and escaped to the cave of Adullam, where his brothers and his father's household heard about it. They went... So when they heard about it, they went to, to, uh, down to him. There. They went down to him there. Verse 2. And those who were in... Number 1, look at them. In distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became who? Their leader. And how many were they? About 400 men were with him. Wait for me here. Now, those are the kind of men he had. When we started, when our ministry was very young, what I had were children. But I wasn't discouraged. God will not begin for you with ministry with the kind of people you, are, you want. That's what I used to tell our, our branch pastors. The people you pastor at the, our Ikun church, are they the kind of people you want? No. The people you pastor at the label, are they the kind of people you want? No. But you know what God will be looking at? God will be looking at your creative instincts. Will you decide to abandon the work because you don't have the people you need? Will you decide to do like that man with giving one talent? To go and bury your talent? And, uh, no, you know, these are not the kind of people I'm expecting. So you know what? I'm going to suspend everything until my people come. And you are praying, my people, my people, come, come, come in the name of Jesus. Uh, God doesn't promote on trial. I remember those days. I can go and bring all my message book. I have been writing message, eh? Preparing message in books right from day one of our ministry. Eight children, children. The, the only person that I say highest in age among us that time was Evangelist Chukudu. I think he's going to be 50 this year or next year. I can't remember. Is it next year? Uh -huh. Next year. So now, minus 50, 50 minus. Uh, 23 years. Okay, so 49 now. Let's say he was 26 that time. He was the oldest person we had. All others, 12, 13, 14, 9, 6. I, I, I remember there are times we have service. I'll be waiting for them. Because one of, some of them will say, my mommy sent me on errand. So I just finished, I came. Some even come and say, I, I'm, I just came to tell you that my mommy said, sent me somewhere. I will not be able to come for fellowship. At such times, God will be testing our hearts. Will you still study the word and prepare a very rich message when all you have is uh, just eight children? Now, that's where so many pastors miss it. At that point, some will just decide. Hey, who? Chao, Mokiki, in the first of message. Let's share the grace, Joe. Some will say, oh, yeah, let's pray, Joe. Some will just get discouraged. I used to have a friend like that in those days. He would always be telling me, Pastor Prince, he, he had never been to our church. I love your church. Do you know why I used to say that? Because every time I go around him, I always say, ah, I thank God, though. I pastor the best people in God's kingdom. And he will always be saying, ah, pastor, my members, that's his own church, the church where he pastor, he will say, my members, they are very, very stubborn. My members, they are very, very disobedient. I don't know these kind of members. So, one day he invited me to preach in his fellowship. I got to the church. I saw adults. After preaching, I now invited him back. He got to our fellowship and said, Pastor Prince, where are those members you used to say they are the best members in the kingdom? I said, they are just these eight children. He said, our ministry is better than you. <laughs> See, 
the first thing you need to do as a minister is to appreciate the resources made available to you per time. Stop complaining. Because whatever you complain about depreciates in value. Appreciate the resources. I used to watch uh, Pastor Michael on, 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 on Facebook. And you don't know that your pulpit eh, is like glass. I used to see you in, you in. He will set the camera. You know, be doing like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what you have. At times when I'm watching the, the reflection, I will laugh. I laugh. She passed home, okay. At the other side, we are looking. <laughs> but that's what he has. Some people will not preach on, on Facebook if all they have is their daughter. And you know, that, that was the error of that man with one talent, you know. The man that was given five talents went to trade with his five talents. The one that was given two talents went to trade with his two talents. But he that was given one, he was offended. You know why? He was looking at the man with five talents. Our calling is not the same. Our resources, startup resources can never be the same. Now, if David were to be today's pastors, people that are in distress, do you know how they behave? They are not organized. They are not happy. They are, very, yeah, they are saddest. They will need negative meaning to everything you are saying. Then, sir, people that are in debt, will they give offering? One not very. So, which means offering level zero. I remember those days in our fellowship when we finished, when we started, we we'll finished service and we now I will now bring the offering basket. When by the time they count it, ah, all these eight children that came, I will give them transportation. Nothing will be left. Then look at the third one. Those who were discontent, I want to go to Buruju. I want you need the Lord. How did he pastor them? So success in ministry. Begins when you what? Begin to appreciate what you have. Appreciate the resources made available to you. When we started, we started, we started under the staircase of our house. Some of you have good beginnings. It was under the staircase. During service, the people we live together would decide to they are, at least we can't stop them from passing to their house now. They will pass. I will have to shift for them to pass. But that was what we have. That's why today, when I see young minister, sometimes they come to me, and hey, Pastor, I don't know how you can support us. Uh, we want to rent to tell. If I want, I brought one list. I want to rent to tell. I want to buy a keyboard. I want to buy a drum set. Now, when I say, what kind of keyboard are you talking about? He mentioned the current keyboard. Latest keyboard. He mentioned the, the drum set. He did, I told him, I said, when we started, we didn't have all those things. I went to buy a Cuba drum. The, under the staircase. And we didn't start with that the big Agbamole. We started with that one they call Samba. You know Samba? You put it on your knees and be beaten. Our first drum set was bought from Oluwa Niobaton Tomboa Shiri at, at the uh, uh, gate. The man does local drum sets. We bought it, we danced. We bought that drums at that time, 3002. We danced. Because now, those days that we bought it, 3002, imported drum set was 11,000 at the time, or some 17,000. We couldn't afford. But we didn't start with it. Though. Appreciate your startup resources. The Bible says, when the bread and the, 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 the uh, uh, fish was not enough, Jesus, our Lord, did what? He gave thanks. And when he gave thanks, what happened? The power of multiplication was activated. God's ability to multiply what you have is resting on your ability to be thankful. 
So one of the reasons why so many pastors are not doing exploit, they are condemning what they have. They are discouraged. They believe they don't have anything. In fact, why some are not even appreciating what they have? Some believe they don't even have anything at all. That's, some, some people believe, I don't think I have anything. You have a wife and you are saying you don't have anything. Oh, you have children, you say you don't have anything. Praise the Lord. So what's number two we are talking about? We are talking about the, the test of creativity. So God wants to see what you can do with the little resources you have. What can you do? Do you know that this prophetic convention we are doing now, we've been doing it since from the beginning. Even when there was no resources, the only, I think the major, the, uh, from this popular ministers reigning in Ibadan now, eh, there are about only two or three that we have not invited in these 23 years. Bishop Francois Luke, I tried, we couldn't reach him. Reverend Femi Manuel, I tried, I got to the, his door post. I couldn't reach him. But apart from him, the day I went to invite Reverend Shola Kualadi of Vine Branch, I didn't have a car. I was on bike. And when I got to this, his office, they, they took me to his office. When he was going, he said, man of God, um, when is your convention? I told him about the convention. He said, okay, I would like to, I'll be part of your convention. Let me see you off to your car. I said, sir, don't bother, sir. I tried to make him go back. He said, no, no, no. And since I tried, he didn't go back. As I got in front of the church, he said, where is your car? I just made a sign. The bike man left where I parked him, and he came, and I climbed the bike and came back to church. And when he came, you know what he said? The first day, he said, I love your pastor. The people were wondering why. He said because he didn't say he didn't have a car. He didn't because he didn't have a car decide not to invite me. He came to our church riding on bike. He said when he was going, his faith touched me. How much did we give him as honorarium then? We gave him what we could afford. 3,000 naira. No, it was 300 naira. Coins. Yes, two days program. Sir, you are a gift of God to the body and I just feel that you should come bless my people. And where are the people? All students. Even as at that time. I don't know why you have joined the church that time. You have not. Apple, you two have not. Okay, you have joined that time. Okay, you, uh, yes, Pastor Michael has been there. He came. And I went back to thank him again. When we were to invite Reverend GFO of blessed memory. He's, yeah, it's yeah, going to be with the Lord. Reverend Lee Kumbabatunde. Do you know, since I've been inviting Bishop Taiwa Adilakun, eh? Since 18 years ago. So you must, please, as a minister, pay attention to this law, the second test, the test of creativity. When the resources is not up to helping you reach the vision. You don't throw your vision away because the people you have are not the people you have received in your revelation. God is using it as an opportunity to test your creative skill. What can you do with these people? Because God won't give you large congregation until he first gives you small one. And those days, how many were we? If you see me come to church, that those days, I'll be teaching on principles on how to excel. Pre and who are the people I'm talking about? Students. Now, one of them called me as I was coming into church today. Papa, there's this land I saw. I, I know you will like it. It's 400,000 per one. I've just bought four. And I've reserved four for you. And I said, okay, you know what? I love, the, I, I know you know what I like. You know what you are going to do? Pay for the four for me. 
me and you will settle later. He said, okay, sir. This was somebody who, when he came here, he wanted to come, go and become a organizer. He said, the day he had me preach, that he was coming in, that he wanted to leave to Lagos the second day to become a organizer, and I preached on a message titled, Pensu. He said, when they had pencil, what's the meaning of pencil? He said, and I started with point number one. That as beautiful as a pencil is, without the help of a sharpener, its impact will not become notable. You need a mentor. He said he took that one down. Now, let me not digress. I <laughs> praise the Lord. But today God has blessed him. So what am I saying? And what am I standing on? We are looking at that second line from David's life. The test of creativity. Creativity. This is when the material you have will not be sufficient to fulfill the vision you have received. God will want to know if you will stop running your vision because of the less material you have. God stands aside watching you. And I gave an example here. Remember that uh, woman in the Bible, the widow of the prophet? Remember her? They were in debt. Their creditors was coming to collect their two sons. What was the first question Elijah asked? Prophet. He said, woman, what do you have in your house? She didn't believe that the oil in her house was her gateway to wealth. Up to tomorrow, see, I appreciate every resources I have. Up to tomorrow, because I learned this at the early stage of ministry. But, but resources, I more appreciate. I know I used to say, praise God, I pastored the best people in the congregation, yeah, I mean, the, in the kingdom of God. Thank God for your life. None like you. Now let's go to number three. Two more and we stop. The next test that you face in ministry on your way to greatness is the test of faithfulness. Number one, the test of pride. Number two, the test of creativity. Number three is the test of faithfulness. This is when God gives you opportunity and it will stand aside to see if the opportunities you have given will make you misbehave. Stand aside to see if the opportunities, opportunities you are given will make you misbehave. Now, how did I know this? Sorry, I'm, I'm monitoring the... Now, how do I know this? Do you remember that the first opportunity David got in the palace was as an instrumentalist. You remember that? Now, he walked so closely with King Saul. He saw the insanity of Saul. I come again. He saw what? The insanity of Saul. When Saul begins to misbehave, David saw him. Then he had another opportunity when he, after killing Goliath, he now walked as a bodyguard to this man. The Bible says one day they were coming from the battlefront and the women started to sing. As the women were singing, David has killed in tens of thousands, Saul has killed in thousands. Saul has killed in thousands, David has killed in tens of thousands. The Bible says, and what happened? As Saul kept a jealous eye. But do you notice that the two times he had opportunity to serve closely with King Saul, 
David didn't misbehave. Now, in ministry, before God brings you up, he will test you with several opportunities. He will test you with power. He will test you with position. He will even test you with connections. Now, let me share this experience with you. The first time God used me to raise the dead, after that encounter, the woman died on the Adenige Street. I was invited in. I prayed what I saw in the scripture. She sneezed. Everybody rejoiced. But I carried it in my head that I had the anointing to raise the dead. So, I now had another opportunity. And what was that opportunity? I was at home. A governorship candidate of one particular state, we are online, I won't mention. They were campaigning. He had chest pain and he died in the car. And because his wife has attended a meeting where I was preaching and I shared the testimony of how God used me to raise the dead. She quickly got my number and called me. Pastor Prince, where are you? I said, I'm in the office. What happened? He said, my husband just passed out now. And they called me from a kitty state that is dead. And I've told them to bring his body down to Ibadan. That my pastor will raise him up. I didn't bother asking God any question. I just went straight. So I told them, where, where are they? They said, should we come to the church? I said, don't come to the church. Where are you now? They said, we have gotten. I, I waited for Mekiti. We have gotten to um, a, a challenge that beside in Kayefele radio station, that's a, uh, 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 Fresh FM. When I had Fresh FM, I stayed there. You know what was crossing my mind? This is an opportunity for my ministry to be announced. So they parked the car in front of Fresh FM radio. I got down. I didn't bother taking my car. I took a bike. I called one of my evangelists. We got there. Where is the dead body? They said it's inside the the ambulance. I entered the ambulance and started praying. Now, top politicians, because this man was a former governorship candidate. He ran for the, he did the election, he, did, he didn't win. So he now decided to the camp to support somebody else. So, top politicians were there. All of them stood outside waiting for I and the dead. To come out of the ambulance. But while I was praying, I just heard, Did you ask me? Ah, who is talking to me? I knew the voice of God now. Ah, Lord, will I have to ask you of everything? He said, This case is a sealed one. You know, when you hear God's voice over a wrong direction, you're, you start sweating. They were still waiting. The woman was telling them, ah, hey, more pastor, me. Hey, 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 pastor. Pastor Falabi. Ah, in fact, you know, you hear God's voice over The evangelist I called, one of my evangelists, he too was praying, Papa, let's, let's continue. I say, Evan, he says, sir, God said he didn't send you. Now, I want you to understand that nobody, is, nobody has control over the power of God. If God raised the dead through your hands, he decides to do it. It's not mean that you are a dead raiser. Now, once you have that understanding, see, it will help you so much. As I came out of the ambulance, you know what the wife said? Pastor Alpha, I said, God said, it's a sealed case. Do you know that instantly they changed their pastor? 
You know what the woman said? Is there color redemption come, Jerry? Is there color redemption come? They left me in front of Splash FM, I mean Fresh FM, without having to say, ah, use this for your transport bag. So I stood in front of I stood in front of Fresh FM. But my greatest lesson is that here, here, I learned from that experience is I see. See, no matter how high God is using you, your focus should remain in your relationship with God. You know, if I had asked the Lord before leaving, he would have told me. You now know what brought honor back to God in my life from that case. When they got to redemption camp, Pastor Adibu gave them some pastors to pray for him. After praying, the pastors had the same thing I had. It's a sealed case. She now called me. Yes, sir. What you saw is what they saw at the camp. You are a man of God. They said it's a sealed case. David passed the test of faithfulness when he saw the insanity of Saul. He didn't go out to announce it. He didn't capitalize on the insanity of Paul to announce himself as king. Don't forget, he already had the anointing of kingship on his head. He would have said, yes, this is the opportunity I've been looking for. Yes, this is the opportunity I've been looking for. He didn't say that. But instead, you will see that whenever King Saul goes into that state, he continues to blow his instrument to help him calm down. Face your assignment. I wrote experience from here. The experience I wrote here. So many ministers of God have changed their message at this point of the test of faithfulness. They now want to preach what is reigning at the moment. You know, there was a time it was deliverance. In the 90s, when we gave our life to Christ and were coming to ministry, what was raining was deliverance. If people don't fall down under the anointing in your church, that service was not powerful. God didn't come. So you had to come to church clean and go to back home dirty. That was what was raining in the early 90s. Then the switch started coming in the year 2000. The prosperity thing. That men of God, because in those 90s, even men of God don't use good cars. But in the, in, the, in the millennium, you see that the switch started coming. That was when the, uh, uh, the seed sowing thing came to church. People sow seed and sow fruits. People sow seed and sow fruits. Now, and the thing kept coming. It got to a point in this millennium, you know, it was Baba something that started raining. Baba Alashepe. Baba Everybody will have a name and a Baba in front of it. We enter the re- a time of prayer. See, you don't preach what is current. You preach what you are giving. Because it is in your assignment that your reward is. But if you do what you are not sent, you will not be paid. So many ministers fail at the point of faith, this faithfulness test. Some have even gone ahead to change the, their ministry location. I have heard that it's like, ah, people who have ministry in so and so place, their ministry is prospering. I, I, I had a friend, he's late now. His death really pained me. Now, he was an, uh, an evangelist. In his days, on, you know, when he was alive, he was an evangelist. Because Pastors, have, pastors are even changing their call now. But when that prophetic thing started raining, he just came up. And I was shocked. He started addressing himself as prophet so, so and so. And there was this prayer that people were putting on him to give them vision. He got to a point he was the hottest prophet in Ibadan. Then 
door of Port Harcourt opened. Now, he got to a point. One day I was in the office, we were talking. He said, Prince, uh, Pastor Prince, I don't even know. I don't even know. My, my church is, is not growing. He said, whenever I'm around, church doesn't grow. Because he, the, the prophecies he, were, he was giving are not prophecies that, they, they are not the kind of prophecies that some people give now. Prophecies he, were, he was giving is like, if you pay good attention very well, it's like psychology. So, and in his church, he already knows all the people. There is nothing new he can say. He kept going from state to state, place to place, until his blood pressure became so high. I remember there was one day we invited him. He was to preach in our church. He preached in our church in the evening. He was to preach the second day evening. He left preaching that evening to Paracot. Left. He, <laughs> he preached in Paracot in the morning and came back to preach in our church in the evening. His blood pressure started going up. He didn't attend to it. His two kidneys packed up. And he died just like that. Don't change your calling. You will go to the faithfulness test. There will be reasons, normal, natural reasons for you to change your call, to change your message, or to even change your location. In fact, do you even know that ministers at this faithfulness point, they even change their wives? Some of them even go to the point of changing their spouse. That maybe, so, I'm telling you true life experience. I've handled some cases. One pastor like that, as a ministry, they do vigils. Before the vigil, the wife was praying with some of the women. So the wife now thought, oh, there's a message I need to pass across to my husband. Rushing to the office, he met her husband on a woman in church committing immorality. So the man, the man of God ran out after his wife and told her, you better be careful. You better don't spread it. That woman has promised to buy a gen for us. She's one of my sponsors. David had to go through these five tests. That's why. Let's, 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 let's take note of this before we leave this realm. That's why, listen, one of the things you must be very, very sure of in your race and ministries, what has God called you to do? Be sure of it. You know, it's like I say, I have three biological children. I say, Eniola, she said, yes, daddy. Go to, she will want to know, go to do what? You're welcome, sir. Go to do what? Most servants of God, the moment they hear, they don't find out first. Lord, what are you calling me to go do? 